Hello, everybody, and welcome to this live stream with myself, Sam Gregory, and the wonderful Charlie Waite. So, Charlie, good evening. Good evening to you, Sam. Thank you for having me on, as they say. No problem. Uh, we would encourage you all to say hello if you're watching on Facebook Live. Uh, drop us a like, leave us a little comment, let us know where you are in the world. I'm sure there's people watching from all over the place. Uh, so do let us know. And this is very much an interactive event. Uh, I'm going to throw over to Charlie in a minute, uh, but a little bit of the background. Uh, we've been doing these weekly sessions regularly with Light and Land, Tuesday at 8pm every week. Uh, last week we had Joe Cornish, and that video is up on YouTube if you missed it. And obviously tonight we have Charlie, and Charlie's taking us to Jordan. And I'm really excited about this because uh, A, I don't know Jordan at all. Uh, B, we get to see some of Charlie's images, which are a little bit different to perhaps some of the ones you may know and I've seen of his in the past and see we're going to treat it really like a sort of uh, travelogue to a degree and Charlie's going to give us a, a bit of background about the locations and so there's actually a really there's about 30 odd images but we're going to linger on five or six which are more of the sort of considered uh, photographic images so to speak uh, but we hope it really gives you an idea of the place and uh, some of the reasons why Charlie chose to do a tour there which happens every December uh, if you're interested in that through light and land but uh, that's probably enough of me talking charlie i'll throw over to you and maybe you can start us off with a bit of background about jordan and why why you went there and why you found it interesting from a photographic point of view as well i'd be delighted to and if everybody will forgive me so that i am um, in the name of accuracy i thought what i would do is have a few notes which nobody can see but that i may refer to um somebody once said to me about jordan that um, that trying to unravel Middle Eastern history would be, could be compared to getting to grips with quantum physics. I thought that was quite funny. Um, and I think many of us, including me, can't honestly say, hand on heart, that I know where each country is in the Middle East. A bit like what used to be, you know, the, um, the, the Soviet, very difficult. Um, but we've, Light and Land have, have subsequently um, found out where they are. And of course, the lovely great Paul Sanders has uh, pioneered some trips to the stars. But let's get back to Jordan and refer to my notes. Yes, this evening, we're going to take a brief look at Jordan and photography in this wonderful country. Uh, it's politically stable, and we, we really shouldn't forget that. I think that's um, often a concern when people go to the Middle East, you know, is it all right? Well, um, uh, the, as far as I know, it's absolutely great. I've been three or four times, so it is stable. There are numerous locations too, but the three that really have to be experienced, I think, are, and I, people who know Jordan may well agree, are Petra, um, the Dead Sea, and of course Wadi Rum. But between these are numerous magnificent um, castles and, uh, and fabulous mountain landscapes and astonishing rock formations. And I know that rock does provide some wonderful photographic opportunities and it allows each photographer to interpret them in their own way and they can really claim the image that they've made as, as truly their own because there's so much scope. But um, going to Petra, it's not known when Petra was built actually, but it began to prosper within the Nabataean Empire and the Nabataeans were one of several nom nom nomadic Bedouin tribes. And they emerged as a distinct civilization and political entity between the second and fourth century BC, just the other day. Um, their business was trade, and Petra flourished in the first century AD, with its population peaking at 20,000. And when I heard that, I was absolutely amazed, because when we look at some of the images in Petra, um, these extraordinary images, not in terms of photography, but in terms of history, You'd, it's hard to believe that 20,000 people lived there. But on May the 19th, how they knew this, I do not know, in uh, 363, that's extraordinary, AD, just the other day again, an earthquake destroyed tragically more than 50% of the city. And a city it was, and then occupied for a while by Bedouin and finally abandoned and only known by a few Bedouin. But in 1812, a Swiss explorer, Johannes Burckhardt, set out to rediscover the lost city and dressed up as an Arab and uh, found this astonishing city, which is now one of the seven new wonders of the world. And then quickly to the um, great Wadi Rum, Peter O'Toole said after making his towering Lawrence of Arabia movie, 
set of photographs filmed by the uh, directed by the great Nick David Lean, uh, who's influenced me a lot. Actually, it's quickly worth saying that one of his great things was to set the scene and hardly any camera movement, and then wait for an event to take place, which is a Cartier-Bresson technique as well. Anyway, Peter O'Toole said after making his towering Lawrence of Arabia, said Wadi Rom, it was vast, echoing, and godlike. And it certainly is when you're there. It's known as the Valley of the Moon, and it is in the far south of Jordan near Aqaba. And it's a vast, timeless place, virtually untouched by human. People do visit, uh, but there are areas that are, there's absolutely nobody there. So Petra, Wadi Rom, and the Dead Sea are the, are the places that I particularly love. And we're looking at this map, and we can see really that Jordan is rather small in comparison to the mighty Saudi Arabia and of course, Egypt and Sudan and Iran. But I think the map is very helpful because it, it gives us an understanding of, of what's what and where's where. And I'm on the capital right up at the top on the Syrian border uh, and right down at the bottom, Aqaba, of which of course, T.E. Lawrence, who we will visit at the end of our, uh, our little uh, program here, um, played a very major part in, and do, I do urge you to go and see Lawrence of Arabia again, uh, really worthwhile. So there we are. Hopefully that gives us an understanding of what's what and where's where. And um, I'm now in the hands of our, our conductor and uh, off we go. So thank you, Sam. Fabulous. I think it's really important actually to always have a good background about where you're going as well. And so knowing some of the background and this particular country, is, as Charlie's mentioned, there's, there's three things we're going to touch on. Uh, but uh, if you can get, connect to some of that history, um, you can hope to you know represent the place and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on but uh charlie i know you wanted to start with the capital amman because that's where uh, certainly on the tour that's where the you know the guys fly into and whatnot and it's a bit of a me melting pot isn't it as we can see in this image it is it's um it's a it's a lovely city and i i have to say the jordanian people are very very open-hearted they really are um and you could say that i suppose of anyone any any country, but there's no question about it. They just accept you for who you who you are, and um, they're very outgoing. They love their conversation, and that's not just in the hotels. So I had a very very warm feeling from the Jordanian people. But here's an example of the way that religions can virtually cohabit. On the left we have a mosque, and probably 150 yards to the right we have the Church of England. And I was talking to Sam a little while ago actually about um, when it was that we had mosques rather late in the day, in my view, in, um, in London. You know, we didn't really see mosques until relatively recently. So um, I think that's uh, indicative of how the various different uh, people with their histories and their backgrounds mingle very, very well together and get on really well together. And Amman is a, a very quiet, and well, not so quiet, but a gentle city full of extremely open-hearted people. So I thought I'd have this as a, an opening image. Yeah, fabulous. And when you get those um, crisscrosses of uh, culture like that, it throws up lots of op photographic opportunities as well. But we, we will keep moving to our three main locations. And uh, if you've just joined us, thank you, because a lot of people have just joined in the last sort of five minutes or so. Uh, Charlie's going to walk through uh, a sort of tour, so a virtual tour, literally, as, as advertised in a way, um, of uh, three main locations within Jordan. And we'll pick up on probably six or seven, maybe eight of the specific images, uh, which Charlie wants to spend a bit more time on. But we hope that the broader set really kind of show you some of the background, some of the scenes you would see if you were if you were visiting Jordan. So let's get into it, Charlie, because this is the Dead Sea, uh, slightly ominous by name. And this is not necessarily a normal Charlie Waite image. So tell me more. No, you're, you're right, it isn't. Um, I think one of the great things for me, and I'm sure for everybody, we all know about photography is about observation and noticing and what I call 360 degree, visually agile, noticing everything. And I, on the whole, I don't think many of us would say, no, that's not my kind of photograph. I will not do this one because there, there must be a lot of temptation and it's a lovely way of stretching oneself and, and exploring one's, um, as, with our acute visual antennae, um, exploring opportunities and possibilities. And, and after all, that's what would probably lead us into um, maybe a broader, more broader areas of photography. Now this I would never do. And yet I thought this is a completely marvelous phenomenon. This is salt encrusted on a, on a rather beautiful uh, red rock. 
Um, there's something quickly to say about the Dead Sea. It, it, it is 400 odd feet, I think, below sea level, maybe more. And um, it is diminishing. And all the rivers that flow into it, uh, the River Jordan being one, they are virtually, that, that's it, they can't get out. Um, so there is a little bit of concern about the Dead Sea, perhaps more than a little bit, but it looked good when I was there um, quite recently. So this, um, this formation of salt, I just thought was completely beautiful and such an overused word, beautiful, isn't it? But I, I think when we come across things in our photography that we know took place absolutely naturally without the hand of man. And that's why Joe talked so eloquently about his lovely part of the world up in the Lake District and, and how so many landscape photographers, including me, love going to Scotland where man just hasn't messed with any part of it. Of course, there will be some interference to a greater or lesser extent, but not that much perhaps. So, and it was, it's much the same here, I thought with the Dead Sea, this is what's going on. There is salt um, encrusting itself onto rocks throughout the Dead Sea. And it's, it's very, very magical place. It really, really is. So I enjoyed it a lot and we'll spend quite a bit of time here uh, exploring, not, not a night, but we certainly will spend two or three hours at least on the shores of the Dead Sea. I'm looking forward to that bit. Fab, yeah, and I think, um... It's slightly otherworldly and actually there's quite a few images in here which are a little bit otherworldly and that play with scale and, and shape and ambiguity mm -hmm. and in fact this is one that I wanted to, us to talk about a little bit as well also at the Dead Sea um, and maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, people's appreciation of the more abstract perhaps and maybe that is, has changed a little in the last few years it seems to be a lot of people are exploring that and it allows you wherever you might be to try and play with shape and form and energy and all those things and actually just before I throw over to you about that just a big thanks to everyone who's telling us where they're coming from we've got people in Cambridge, Durham, Cape Town, Northumberland, Dorset, Devon, uh, the Black Isle up in the Scotland there, Frankfurt, fabulous so keep those coming and if you have any questions for Charlie uh, do pop them on the comments I, I will try and pick those up as we go but Charlie let's talk then about abstract and extracts and and you know how to go about making sense of some of these sorts of scenes and this image in particular. Um, that, that point of, about being visually agile is one of my little pet phrases. I'm sure people are getting fed up with it, but um, it helps me a lot to not just look and see, but really look and really, really see. And um, I said to somebody the other day, I think photography helps you to see more. I hope there are lots of our audience nodding their heads saying, yes, it does. And I, I, I was even rather more um, presumptuous and said that everybody should be a photographer to a greater or lesser extent. And of course, everybody is because everybody has a camera. And when they see something fascinating and, and magical or beautiful or whatever it may be, the response is to want to own it, isn't it? And, um, and, and that's what the camera does. So I don't know anybody who's gone on a holiday without a camera. So... That's an interesting point we might discuss, Sam, you and I later. But discussing this a bit, um, the first thing is, of course, is it from a NASA spacecraft? Um, is it, you know, a series of extraordinary estuaries cut into the, uh, etched into the landscape, you know, 500 miles below? Or is it something that's just uh, two feet from the front of the lens? Uh, well, interestingly enough, it was about 30 feet from the front of the lens. And um, it's rather unusual for me to do patterns but you made a very, very good point, which I think is interesting. Uh, in recent years, I don't think anyone would have intentionally wobbled the camera in order to get an effect. We now have a term, don't we? ICM. Is that an ICM? People say, you know, just a sort of throw it away, a throwaway line. But it's fascinating what people are doing, aren't they? Photographers are really exploring the, the, this extraordinary craft and, and interpreting their photographs in a way that we never would have done, you know, as little as 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. So it really has grown. And I think it's producing some, some great work, some really great work. It, I, I call photography the people's new common language. And it really, really is. We're expressing ourselves using the camera so brilliantly. And um, I'm not sure this is a brilliant photograph, but it's one that I rather like because it's a bit ambiguous. Um, and I think one isn't quite sure of the proportions and we're not, we're not quite sure, whether, as I mentioned earlier, whether it's from above or from the side, quite what it is, um, and whether, whether those little tiny flecks are shoals of fish. So 
there are, if there's a bit of ambiguity about a photograph, that's fine by me. We don't have to always know exactly what it is. Um, I think most people, I hope, would, would agree. What do you think about that? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think, like you say, there's a there's a scale ambiguity going on. There's an orientation ambiguity going on. And of knowing we're at the Dead Sea, the pattern reflecting the, you know, the dry, baked out land, as it might be. So, um, yeah, an intriguing one. And, and, and not, and as I've said earlier, I'm, I am intrigued by a lot of the images in here. I'm really excited we're talking about them because a lot of them might be new for people to see. And um, it just shows, I suppose, when you when you tune into a location, you become visually agile, like you say, and, and perceptive and aware. You can be conscious of, uh, yeah, representing that in different ways, not not as always as literally, but um, yeah. So I think a really nice one. And I, as again, if there's any questions, do let us know. Lots of nice comments coming in about this particular one, Charlie. So. There you go. You may have a future as an abstractor or extractor. <laughs> uh, shall I shall I move us on? Uh, because we have a another worldly another other worldly scene here. Let's explain what's going on here. Um, I put this in intentionally because I think it's probably one of the most extraordinary gear shifts, gear changes one has to do when looking at this. There's the and and Sam very kindly allowed me to have this one and the one that follows. I think to many people, this would be a panoramic, a mountain range, um, just full of rock, nothing going on inside, absolutely impossible to imagine anybody even being in there, except perhaps somebody grazing some, some animals, um, and maybe a few clefts and clifts, and, and that's about it. But at the height of Petra civilization, 20,000 people were in there, 20,000 people plus, and they were conducting their lives in the way that a city of 20,000 people would, but nobody knew they were there. And what's interesting is the entrance, which I hope we are about to see, appears in the next image there. And that's where we enter into Petra after a sort of seek passage of about a hundred and, oh, no, I don't know, probably a kilometer and a half maybe. Um, and we walk into this uh, uh, area here, this sort of gully, and it's quite uh, enclosed and it's very, very exciting because if you haven't been to Petra before, you have no idea what you're going to see. Well, I hope I'm not going to um, spoil the surprise, but this at the end is what you see. You see this extraordinary building. You walk through and I think the next image is of the treasury. That was made probably 200 years, maybe BC or certainly at the turn maybe between BC and AD, I don't know, but it's, it's thought, no one has any precise knowledge, but it is quite extraordinary and not very um, heavily restored. So the majority of that is as it was. So there they were without the sort of steel scaffolding, without, you know, HGVs or whatever it is and, and, um, and trucks and all by hand. And this was a tomb and there are two, four, five tombs underneath down in the basement. So they dug into the rock with what tools, I know not. But that's the first site that I got when I came into Petra and I can't wait to get back. It's an absolutely below the belt experience and there are no words, there are absolutely no words. You can gasp. And that's what I spent most of the time in Petra doing with just my mouth open in a, sense, in a state of total amazement. And I think we go on now to see some more tombs. Yes, here's the size of this tomb. This is probably about 120 feet high. And it'll be their, their noble um, citizens who, who died and, um, and who obviously highly thought of and had funds. It was a trading, uh, trading city, Petra. And, um, and the usual, usual suspects, frankincense and myrrh and various other things, obviously. And the tombs are numerous. Thank you, Sam. There's another one. And they, they're they just quite extraordinary. And one of the reasons they're extraordinary is you, you can't quite understand how they did it. it it's, it always amazes me, really, how, how all those years ago they could produce something that is not just te technically brilliant, but aesthetically beautiful. The relationships, the balance, the, uh, the sort of austerity of them. Thank you, Sam. The, you know, the positioning of them. The relationships, the, the decoration, all of these things were absolutely astonishing to me. Difficult to photograph, they really were. It's a question of obviously lighting, 
but um, there's a there's the history one hopes will will um, will be evident, and I think there's some wonderful details. Hopefully, we're going to be seeing some marvelous details of rocks. And and uh, here's another example. There are numerous examples in the heart of Petra. It's a very very big area. When we go to Jordan, I think we'll be there two to three days. We'll certainly have two or three trips into Petra, which is um, I think. About, about enough, but there may be many, many people who would like, well, we're a very small group, but who'd like to keep going back. But um, we'll- Charlie, uh, yeah. sorry, can I, can I put it? One thing that's very interesting actually is the symmetry that's used in, in all of these tombs and the designs, you know, even if we go back to the very first image is, is the facade that you would see on the way in. And yes. it, it's fascinating that that symmetry, you know, was something that people sought thousands of years ago you know what is it inherently and that we look for as photographers that that we find pleasing why do we why are we pleased by aesthetic symmetry a difficult question <laughs> and, order. and order you're no but you're you're quite right i mean i often liken uh, landscape photography to a degree to in, interior design where where one responds and and wants to particularly it wants to kind of find and and joe was talking about it the other day established relationships and and, and various parts of the landscape talking to one another and echoing one another to make a pleasing, coherent, cohesive whole. And you're absolutely right, Sam. I mean, here's an extraordinary example. You know, look at, look at the doorways. And can you imagine what they would have looked like when they were in good nick? I mean, this is, this is uh, whatever, nearly 2,000, over 2,000 years ago. It's un unimaginable. You're quite right. I mean, they are beautiful. And then the numbers of little triangles up there, they match. And, it's extraordinary. Yeah, I wonder how, you know, why those shapes have always given us order, but that's probably one for a, uh, another day in more detail. But just a quick one on here. Obviously, we have somebody in the image here. And, you know, I, I know people don't necessarily think about you necessarily shooting images of, of or of portraits. But I've seen some of your work from, from times when you've been traveling and you do shoot with people in. Is that something here that there's a chance to do? And is, is that something that you can yes, help set the scene a little. No, there, there really is. I, I met, years ago, I did a book on Venice, and we don't want to bring that up, but I will. It's worth mentioning because one or two people said there's no people in it, but of course, Venice is lovely for its architecture. Lovely is an understatement. Its architecture, um, but and of course, the Venetians aren't actually there. They they live outside Venice. So here, there are people. There are Bedouin tribes people who are incredibly gracious and out, amazingly outgoing. And not there just to you know take your money. They're really, really giving people. And uh, this lady, I think she found it. She knew I was doing a photograph, and I felt intrusive. And uh, afterwards, I did just say thank you, and she just said it was absolutely fine. You know, imagine if we're photographed as we come out of our supermarkets. Um, it, it it must be <laughs> quite an invasive experience. So yes, I I feel very uh, tentative before I photograph a person, and um, and usually seek permission. But I, I thought she lent a little, a little gesture, if you like, a little punctuation in the image with her red scarf. Yeah, absolutely. Um, quick questions come in about the whether it's very busy, especially in in Petra. Obviously, it seems you know it's, it's become very well known now. How, how do you find that in terms of uh, too many people there? Do you have to be a little selective with how you shoot, or is it about what time you go, etc.? It's about what time you go. It, it never troubled me because um, a, a number of people will only go into the first part of Petra. They, they won't go deep in. Um, they won't climb the steps, which is perfectly manageable. Um, 300 odd steps up to the El Deir Monastery, which we, I think, might be looking at. But it is, it's a good question, uh, but it's not over, overrun and hence going at the time we want to go at, which is uh, December. Um, I found it, I find it absolutely fine. People are very uh, caring and uh, sensitive and discreet. And um, my word, you can quit, you can hide yourself away because the people who do go, they generally just go for an hour or two down through the, the sort of main drag. But hardly anybody, if anybody, goes up into the tombs. Hardly anybody goes up some little side steps to look at the rock formations. I was never troubled by anybody. I never had to wait for anyone to get out of my photograph. And okay. um, that was, yeah, so rest assured to that individual. Okay, fab. Um, shall I take us on a little? I know this is a little backstory behind this one as well, and then we'll we'll move forward. 
Yes. Um, well, the sculpture in the in the rock, I just can't believe how it was done. I'd, I'd love to know what tools they use because the rock is really quite hard. In parts, it's quite porous, but pretty hard. Um, and all these wonderful, wonderful colors. This was um, uh, the, the bottom of, um, of, a, of a Bedouin tribes person, a Nabataean, I'm sure, uh, who was pulling a camel. And you can just, you can't see it here, but you can just make out the camel. Uh, behind them, a huge camel, bigger, bigger than life, larger than life, a, an enormous camel carved into the rock, just as de decoration, just because it was obviously a, a nice thing to do. But maybe there was a, a other reasoning behind doing it. But um, I thought the carve the carvings are, are quite marvelous. They really are. And I thought this one was rather charming. Well, you climb up the steps. And it's a bit of a trek, but it's worth it. And you can go the back way, which I've done a couple of times. And here is the great and wonderful El Dayan Monastery. Uh, it's almost not it's almost not worth speaking about. But I I was standing next to somebody who burst into tears when they saw this, and uh, he was absolutely overwhelmed. He was an architect from London, and he just looked at this and he tears came down his face and he just said how 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 <laughs> and it was an incredibly moving moment and i was not far behind him saying yeah what can we what can we say and he he tried to explain to me what it would have looked like uh, in its finer days but it's in terrific condition and again not a great deal of restoration it's a it's a monastery uh, but uh, made up of a series of tombs the interesting thing about black and white, if we've just got time, is um, uh, a lot of people just say, uh, and I really do endorse it, endorse this, that you, you can't ever say black and white is better than colour, or colour is better than black and white. That's an insane, childish, immature thing to say. It's not more artistic, it's not less artistic, it's just uh, uh, what somebody might want to do. And I did on this occasion. Black and white photographers do not have any comment to make about color and uh, negative comments and color make color photographers make no negative comments about black and white. It's a it's a lovely even playing field, but black and white and color has its place. And my golly, I thought that black and white here somehow helped to convey the history, the, the historical sense of the place. Um, maybe color is very now. I don't know. But it's an open my open question, and it's always fascinating to hear what people's views are. But there's no definitive view; it's just down to choice. And I felt that today, here at the El Dayer Monastery, to accentuate shadows, perhaps, and uh, the tonal values, and uh, the good old zone system was fun to play with. And I think, in for me, the black and white treatment of the great and amazing El Dayer Monastery was appropriate. I don't know what others would feel. Um, what do you think, Sam? Yeah, no, no, I'm not going to argue with you. Um, I think what's interesting, I was um, the black and white is an interesting point. Also, there's, there's a few images you've shown us here, which are fairly what they feel like sort of two one sort of fairly wide uh, shots going on. And, you know, to capture some of that grandeur is that, mm -hmm. you know, obviously in the pano, we had that even in the city in Anan as well. Mm -hmm. um, and is that is that a, a sort of framing that you play with to help accentuate that grandness sometimes on a, on a sort of uh, horizon, horizontal scale? Such a good question. I, I am, um, and I know many of my colleagues have, have had a 617 in the past, um, and they've used them brilliantly. We've got some marvellous panoramic photographers, in, including Joseph Sudek, amazingly, used panoramic, did a whole book on panoramas of Prague. But what's quite interesting is that the 617 format uh, is still very pleasing. I think a little bit more than that, and it becomes too skinny. So three to one, uh, I think I enjoyed a lot. Um, this wasn't, this was cropped. But many of us now are stitching and doing it really, really well. Um, I sometimes have a go at it and don't do it terribly well. But, um, and I know many photographers who've got landscape photographers who enjoyed the 617 Fuji panorama, art panorama, Linhoff, um, Technica, all sorts of different ones. So um, I, I think it's it's just about human vision, the parameters of human vision, which I suppose is oval essentially, and maybe from oval came the came the um, thirty five mils, um, possibly. But um, I do like I do like panoramic when it's when it's appropriate. Yeah, right. 
couple of sorry, a couple of quick things about people commenting on the black and white help helping concentrate the mind on the textures and the patterns. And um, beautiful in black and white enhances the drama of the structure and its history, as you were alluding to that sort of timeless feel, isn't it? But should we should we take a step on, Charlie? Yep. On we go. Um, I'm very fond of this photograph. Now I don't know whether I'm sure. Actually, I'm going to assume that many people have um, uh, found a photograph they've made, and then they they become progressively more in love with it. And um, and I and and it can work the other way too. We know we know that. Um, but I what I what I liked about this is the 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 fact that I was able to establish what what was lovely about it. And I found that the top of the tree, um, just the sort of lumpy bumpy nature of the top of the tree, the branches somehow hooked up quite nicely with the sort of almost molten lava or was once. Um, in the background, the diabolical relationship of colour, um, the sort of cold green and very, very warm background. I worked quite hard to make sure that the top of the tree didn't um, bisect the horizontal. I'm, I'm in treatment for this condition, by the way. Um, Clive made, Clive Minute, one of our leaders, made a terrifically funny joke saying that he hoped, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was a, it was a massive send up, which I received gleefully. I really liked it, and um, and but I do care about things like that. So and also the rather strange um, blue background, sort of almost granite rock, and then the light on the the light on the trunk I thought was very pleasing. Uh, it's it's not often that you see a trunk exposed in that way because more often than not, I suppose they were vulnerable to wind and rain and the elements and so on, and that perhaps gave that tree trunk the exposure. The and, you know it was vulnerable to rain and so on. And looking at that trunk, it's a bit of a tenuous relationship, but it, it was there for me. It has a rather nice relationship with the little verticals in the, what we're going to call the volcanic rock uh, um, behind. So the, the relationships that uh, you can identify pre-production in your image gives you a wonderful sense of certainty and assurance that in terms of structure, the image probably will, and oh, what a funny word this is, it'll work, like a beautiful melody will work, or a wonderful meal for your guests will work, and photographs will work, or they won't, we know that. And um, I was very pleased with this um, relation, this series of relationships that are actually quite, quite multidimensional, if you like, all sorts of things going on. The little tree looked lit by, you know, heavenly light and it looked sort of stately and, and noble and it didn't really warrant such importance. It's not a very big tree, but nevertheless, it's been accorded with a degree of importance. Look at me kind of thing. So I, I look back at this and, and get great pleasure from it. And also just being there, never mind what I'm photographing, but just being there. And we know recently to conclude, we know recently that um, we've been able to really focus on the, the natural world. Um, hopefully many people have had an opportunity to at least observe it and um, spend time looking at it deeply. And um, and I certainly did that here. Sorry, a bit of a ramble, Sam. No, no, lovely. I, I'm happy to let you ramble. I mean, I think you've pretty much covered everything I wanted to ask about it, but lots of things do work. And it, as you say, maybe it's one of those ones you keep coming back to. I think for me, just as a couple of little end notes, and then we'll move on because there's another beautiful tree coming up next, actually. But just the fact it's sort of held up on this little plinth here uh, of rock, so to speak, which is catching some lovely light. And obviously the, the obvious question is, how is there a, a rock and so, uh, uh, something natural and soft like a tree in what seems like an impossible place to have? You know, it, had that no, tree. it had no business being there. It was quite extraordinary. It really, really was. And um, I... I didn't really, I didn't really have much choice, and and nor did a few people with me. And we, interestingly, we some of us did it from one side. I think there were two people with me, and it was the back road to the Eldaria Monastery, which is um, about a four-kilometer walk. Um, and one has a choice to go either way through Petra or through or around the back. So I, I found, I thought it was a heroic little tree. It really was, and I'm rather in love with it. And I can't wait to say hello to it again. Well, we've got another lovely tree coming up, actually, which is, I'm going to say, probably my potentially my fave from this group of images. So, um, 
Mm. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot going on here. There's a there's a beautiful symmetry coming up from the from the bottom of the trunks. And but I will let you uh, do the pros on this, Charlie, because this is obviously well, one you found and fell in love with too. Well, I did, I did, and and um, firstly, thank you for your compliment. That's always lovely. Gratefully received. I suppose what it does do um, for us um, is it begins to introduce us um, fairly close up the the nature of the colour of the rock, which we're going to see, I think, a bit more of which I have never seen anywhere else in the world. I mean, I haven't traveled as far as many people have, but I've been to one or two places. And, and I must say, I've never seen rock like the rock I see in Petra. Um, one of the members of our group um, on our last trip to Jordan produced some quite devastatingly impressive, I mean, really striking images of rock, some little cameos, and they were just extraordinary. And um, he was very, very um, uh, adept at doing that. Looking at this one, that little tree with its little feet sort of you know, spread slightly apart and then the big branches doing much the same thing, I just thought was too enchanting. And, um, and one, one, I think one develops a relationship that I did with the other tree. I mean, they're sort of living beings and this one's just living. Um, and, it, and it becomes something that you, you analyze and you evaluate and you, you, you become definitely become fond of because it's contributing to your image making process. So you're bound to sort of have a kind of relationship with it and, and really quite a deep one because you're observing every single part of it. You don't look at anything globally. Landscape photographers don't do that. You know, we don't just say, oh, isn't that lovely? Um, and this produce a photograph of it. We, we immerse ourselves. I mean, we're now using words like full immersion. Aren't we? And, um, and I think that's what many photographers in the past did. And you have to kind of do really and i certainly did with this one the branches of the trees i found really fascinating certainly the two main ones because they took on the same color as the rock behind and that crevice between the two rocks um it seemed just an extraordinary place for um for the tree to be but i'm so glad you like it and um, i'd like to hear why why you do just because you do that's good enough for me sometimes it is just because isn't it yeah i think i think just catching it at exactly a great time that you're so lucky it wasn't full of leaves in a way because i think just allowing us to see past this and it's sort of it's weird because it it feels like it shouldn't work because those colors are very similar and there'd be a fear it's all just going to blend in back to the background but there's there's definition and then he managed to find some uh, separation despite the fact physically there is very little separation because of probably the texture and how the light is catching some of these wispy you know uh, leafless branches so no I very much I very much enjoy this one and, and actually it's getting some love on Facebook there's plenty of people <laughs> it, uh, and the green the green being very cold color that that yes. is really quite they're very it's very prominent of course set against um, a hot background and actually just that final comment you made about the um yes the sort of crevice behind there just it just could have followed on quite beautifully up couldn't it from here very naturally and mm. some of the, yes, that's we've talked a bit, little bit about it, and I think a lot of people will um, know that from your imagery. And you joke about being obsessive about the fine details of just millimeters of lining things up. But I think it's those the devil is in the detail, so to speak, and mm. uh, that very much pays dividends here. But let's get to some of the rock formations because I know you mentioned here about mm. uh, the amazing rock structures around this area, and we've got a couple of things that we just wanted to walk through quickly and there's one I think we're going to linger on um, but it, it can be uh, tricky sometimes can't it because you're there's technical challenges of shooting some of these because you might be up close or you might be using a telephoto to sort of zoom and crop in uh, but it's unstoppable sometimes when there's such shape and form is that fair to say yes it, it really is it, it's quite interesting when you're faced with um with a, a combination of, of shapes that has seemed to be a complete muddle. And it was only in this one that I began to realize that I, I needed to assert myself over it and, and produce a sense of order and, and form and um, sort of, I'm trying to think of voluptuousness, it's probably not the right word, but, but balance, there we are. Um, and that arc in the middle seemed to work quite well. And the lighting was quite, I thought worked quite well, but the coloring is people obviously with it come on it, that those colors are diabolical. Well, that's, that's what we find when we, when we go to Petra. Um, 
but looking back at the others, um, I do find it difficult because I'm, I'm trying to apply myself in the way that I have applied myself in, I don't know, 30 or 40, did I say it, years. So, which is always trying to, trying to grapple with the image that I have been able to, thank you, Mr. Adams, um, previsualize. And, uh, and then the, the trying to have parity between what you previsualize and what actually is there in front of you. It's, it's quite a lovely, wonderful, it's called be creative struggle. And, and I, I've walked away from quite a few, as many people will have listening to us, I'm sure will have, will have said, well, I, I know what I want and it's not here for me today. I, it's just not here. So I'll come back another day or I'll never come back. It was a near miss and we all know that once or twice, it's not a near miss, it's absolutely the opposite. And we, then we know why we are landscape photographers. Oh, don't we just, <laughs> we know so well then why. And it's a real treat. Mr. Adams, 12 a year and you're doing well. I'll never forget that. 12 a year and you're doing well. And this one gave me an immense pleasure. It really did. So um, there are people who do some marvelous rock formations and, um, and there'll, there'll be opportunities when we go to Jordan to produce something that will be absolutely theirs to own and theirs only to own because it gives to, it, there's so much latitude yeah in fact there's definitely the chance to uh wrestle with shape and and flow and energy and it can be quite a absorbing thing you can uh, we mentioned it with joe on the talk last week you can lose yourself for sort of okay. half an hour 45 minutes spent over the tripod and those are the those are the minutes uh that you can't buy and that you can't have in your day-to-day -day life and if you Managed to do it somewhere with outrageous swirls and colours, then all the better for it, I suppose. Uh, quick, quick comment coming in that yes, yeah, similar coloured stone in in bungle bungles in Australia. Yes, it's that very red sort of orangey colour, isn't it? So um, looks like a stick of Blackpool rock. <laughs> that's true. Uh, that's, that's certainly one interpretation. Charlie, let's move us on just for time purposes. I'm going to keep us a little bit honest, but this is just another example, obviously of. Yeah repetition i mean they look like oyster shells don't they stacked up with just the different wrong colors um and so once again that a natural occurrence that um yes we could have a geologist telling us how but the fact is it did and i think um photography for all of us and i can't claim this just for me it it it, it, it is there for us to demonstrate our sense of complete wonder and absolute amazement about the things that we see and this photography that we want to immerse ourselves into uh, is simply a, to no, no more or less than a question of, of trying to seize that human experience and interpret it and produce a photograph. And I'm just repeating what I think everybody thinks. I don't think I'm coming up with anything new. I think that's why we do it. It's so good when it's good. And it's not awful when it's bad, is it, Sam? Really? No, no. There's, I there's, go. I go. there's worse things to be going out in the world and, and doing. And maybe when, when you have these abstracts or extracts, it's nice to think about little sets of them as well. That, that would be a lovely thing to take home from a trip like that. Um, uh, there was one other one from the detail point of view before we move on uh, geographically as well, I think. But this knotted tree I wanted to chat quickly about as well. Tell us, tell us here again. Um, it's it's near a place called El Fenan. It's um it's a, a, a nature reserve where we probably will spend one night, I think. And what I like about it particularly is once again repetition, diabolical repetition. I mean, I, I, I it is just a tree trunk. That's how it is. And I've come in quite tight, and that area probably is about five foot high and by about five foot wide, something like that. And um, I think we've all come to understand now um, that trees play a, sorry about that, it's foolish of me. Trees play um, a hugely important role in the, in the landscape photographer's repertoire. And um, even for people who are not landscape photographers, trees play a, a very important role indeed, emotional and otherwise. And um, this tree was alive, but you really wouldn't believe it, would you? So um, I thought it was rather a bit like Art Nouveau in a way. Uh, uh, anyway, I, 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 I enjoy it a lot, and I think it might look not too bad if it was if it was quite big. But the colours are interesting, a sort of orangey and, uh, and creamy grey colours. It's it's twisted, isn't it? Tortured. Yes. 
yeah gnarled and i mean oh. what's interesting just yeah final i think i suppose final thought on that it covers because it covers a lot of the things we've talked about even in the man-made structures that we saw within the rocks with some of these similar colors where man was looking for symmetry and order and i suppose we imbibe some of that from the natural world and when we find it like this in the natural world and we compare it with our own sense of order in in architecture or whatever it might be you have this beautiful connection to it is that fair to say mm. most question most certainly most certainly um i i think once once we touch that and we 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 get involved in our photography we can't we can't let it go really and i think we become more and more discerning and more astute and it it enables our human process of of experiencing the world around us, particularly us. And I, I think photography is, it truly is the people's new common language. And um, it's just marvelous. The number of people who are joining the conversation, as I sometimes put it, is completely marvelous. I, I, I know that if I see someone photographing, I could get along really well with them. <laughs> I think we all do, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. Let, let's move us on just for a time point of view. I'm keen to keep us nicely on time. It's my job here amongst others and just this we've got a couple of just background shots from from the different locations here just maybe just explain charlie this location and, and some of the background yeah it's not far from Amman. um it's um a roman city and they're they're difficult to photograph I, I will say that um but they it's imperative that we go to see it this is jerash it's huge it was really really big now there's not so much of it left but you can still see a lot of it at the back there's some wonderful details. A lot of it's still intact. Um, we would get there a little bit earlier than this. So the shadows are, are really thrilling and being able to play with those shadows and, and the relationship between highlights and shadows, we know are the stuff of what photography is. Um, and I would strongly recommend, um, well, I do insist that we spend at least two or three hours. Here. And, um, and then there's the Citadel where I think we might be seeing a photograph of as, as well. Um, and this was Jirash as well. Now, you mentioned, you made a very good point about aesthetics and beauty. And here's something that was done, <clears throat> I don't know, however many years ago. It was just quite remarkable. It's so utterly, utterly beautiful. So, and we know that Greek and Roman architecture is beautiful. And uh, it remains to be seen whether we're going to leave anything of great, any great beauty. That's another conversation. But it certainly did for us to feast our eyes on <clears throat> excuse me and you were talking about symmetry and aesthetics and look at that that marvelous shell quite marvelous and that's i can tell you that shell is about three feet uh, across it's it's pretty big i mean this jordan itself has been it's pr pretty new really isn't it in, in terms of its current country status but there's been romans there's been ottomans there's been all sorts through that land so whenever you find that in places you do get this um back catalogue of interesting architecture and so you i would imagine it's quite interesting to see lots of that over over a number of locations um i would i will bring us though to wadi rum because i know we want to spend a little bit of time there's a couple of images uh we've got sort of 10 15 minutes left everyone so thank you for staying with us and like i say if you do have any questions do keep those coming in i'm keeping my eye on all the comments um but an, another lovely black and white image charlie and lots of lines and triangles you know i'm a mad triangle hunter so <laughs> this is very uh this is very of the location isn't it so tell us a little bit more it really really is um uh, I'm, I'm just trying to think of the best way of putting it well in in fairly simple terms um you arrive in wadi rom and the first thing you experience is uh, a sense of immense grandeur um you feel you feel uh, you you have a very overwhelming experience that you are the very first person to be there because there's nobody else hardly when you first get there you might see a few people during the course of the day we're there but generally speaking you feel it's a private personal monumental discovery which you will live with for the rest of your life and i think um um peter O'Toole said he'll, ne he'll never be the same after he spent all that time filming what an experience that was and catering trucks and everything there were people there then but coming back to this so the very first thing one needs to try and produce if you happen to be a landscape photographer is is a landscape image that somehow and i keep using this word has parity with your own human experience and it's pretty it's a big ask isn't it 
to produce a two-dimensional image that is going to in some way convey back to yourself and hopefully to a wider audience what you felt. And I hope this does that. Um, the man on the camel just happened to be passing through. I didn't choreograph him, but even if I had, would it have been such a crime? He was in exactly the right place. Oh, by a whisker he was, because the top of his head, as you can see, is nearly intersecting that horizon, which would have troubled me, I think, and there'd have been a little conflict there. I do like that extraordinary um, diagonal line, what looks like a sort of remnants of a contrail from an airplane. I don't believe it was. Um, and then matching up the same one, a black one down on the, on the desert floor. Um, timing was good. Um, they're huge chunks of rock. Uh, some of them are about 1400 feet high. Some of the mountains, the one behind in the distance, I think is very, very high indeed. So the sense of the the loneliness, I think, is terrifically good. It's, it's very, very good for us to feel entirely alone there. And you feel, you feel so elevated by the Wadi Rom experience. Um, and I just can't wait to get back. Um, Colour and black and white, it suits. It really does suit, suit both very well indeed. Timing is good. Up at dawn and then a pause in the middle of the day and back for the evening light. And then you start seeing shadows like you might never have seen before. <laughs> I know that's rather an overstatement, but it's a pretty special place. There are lots of special places, but Wadi Rom has got a place right here in my heart for me. That's what it's all about, isn't it? It's finding those places and those moments you have, you'll always remember as well. And a comment here, um, in the moment taking this shot, were you extremely excited? Yes, I was. Okay. I was. You have a thunderbolt of confirmation that just goes through you. And we all know that. I'm just my way of describing it. We all know that. We, we just all know that. Gardeners get it, musicians get it when they're seeking the elusive melodies. Suddenly it comes from somewhere and they've got it and they, there's just no, nothing like it. We're all creative in our own, in our own special ways. We really are. And, um, and photography is right up there with, with any other art form. I won't, I won't allow it to be um, put down by anyone, ever. <laughs> I feel incredibly strongly about what photography does for human beings um, in large numbers now. It's, it's marvellous. Yeah. And like, yeah, and lots of nice comments coming in about this in the black and white, channeling your Ansel here, as in Mr. Adams, of course, which I'm sure will be a nice compliment to give Charlie. Um, there's a couple more we just want to touch on. Obviously, you know, there's devastating light and oranges and blues. And we just wanted to pop this in because of that as well, didn't we, Charlie? We did. Yes, we did. Cross lighting. Um, you really do appreciate in Wadi Rum, um, as, as no doubt you'd appreciate in any, in any desert. But that, that evening, when that sun goes down, and I'm, I'm not particularly fond of photographing the sun as it itself going down, although some people are awfully good at doing that. But I rather like the cross lighting where it, it it's sort of, I'm trying to think of the right word, streaks, for want of a better word, across a bit of landscape that's essentially um, without lighting. And that band of light that just picks up their legs and both of their left legs are both doing the same thing at the same time. And you might say, hold on, is that a little bit of post-rationalization, which is uh, often something that many of us may be accused of, but no, it isn't. I just remember thinking there's something right about it. I don't quite know what that is. And of course, when I looked at that frame, I realized that I, I must have been um, aware, uh, sometimes globally, but we do, we do attend to detail. And when we say, ah, oh, yes, I think I've got it, it probably was because there was that lovely moment of, of coherence where both their legs um, were, were up at the same time. And the lighting and the rim lighting, I think, was important. Oh, I'm glad we've got this one. We're, we're still in Wadi Rom. Do you want to say, shall I soldier on? Well, yeah, very briefly, I just wanted to say I was really happy we could talk about this one because it's, um, again, it's a little bit different, but uh, lots of the themes we've talked about with observance, with symmetry, with pattern, with shape, with texture come into this as well. So I'd love to hear it from from your mouth as well. And everyone who's still with us, we've just got a few left. So do do stay with us another 10 minutes or so while we finish these uh, images. And, and 
Charlie's tour around Jordan. But yes, yeah, let's hear a little from you on this, Charlie. Well, um, I've never seen this train before in Wadi Rum. There's only one track. And the thing that I found it extraordinary was that it, it never will be painted. It never will be repainted because what would be the point? Because the desert's fairly inhospitable and it throws all sorts of conditions at things like trains. And at, I thought it was diabolical to look at that incredible vivid yellow, vivid yellow and vivid green. It's, it's, um, it's luminous almost. And I, and I found the three relationships, the three colors, yellow and red and green and, and, the, and, the, and the wheels underneath and the blue sky. I thought it was extraordinary, fairly diabolical, but I, but I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, I enjoy that one too. I, I, let's uh, have uh, another of a wider landscape though. And this is an int intriguing one, actually. Um, lots of the things we've talked about with coherence, with repetition, with, with flow and energy, uh, and these lovely lines here up in the in the cloud line. And, and I really appreciate the fact there's this space up here. It helps with the depth, but maybe gives a little bit of the background in terms of location and again of, of your thoughts about the image on this, Charlie. Um, well, thank you for asking me. The, um, I, I think that old expression foreground interest is still alive and well in photography. Um, and I, and I, it's perhaps we don't need to use that term anymore. But the, but the, I, am I right? I think you'd agree or like that the, the eye, the human eye, um, wants to begin somewhere, a bit like the front of a stage of a play, of a play. So they they need to see the the thing that's offered to them, the item that's offered to them, the character that's offered, the piece of furniture, just uh, uh, after the footlights. And so I think to offer you a something that you found as a photographer had a good relationship with the land with the background right at the back in terms of um, slope. For example, the foreground rock on the left, it's got the same sort of slope as the, as the other one, right in the distance. Um, and I think that that really helps. And, um, and I, I, I sometimes don't have anything particularly um, forthright, if you like, in the front of the image, but I, I rather like this one. And those two sort of almost look like living beings, just the hulks in the foreground. And um, I was a bit concerned about not not enough blue sky and of course the first thing we always think about many of us is the relentless monotonous blue not alleviated by any cloud <laughs> oh i better crop it off but i'm glad you you didn't think it was um unnecessary that it was okay and i i'm i've i've stayed with it and i i do really like the warm sunlit mount hills in the background and this rather strange semi-magenta colors in the foreground i thought uh, rather intriguing i like yeah. the relationship and shadows in the mid distance yeah it's a, and again it's another thing we talked about uh with joe last week as well and when you when you have such large physical um images uh, in terms of the depth uh, literally within the frame it's it's so important to have those gradations between light and shade and just that the, the lovely light here um catching at the back just helps give that three-dimensionality and i'm really glad that you left these fairly um, in shadow, because the, I think a lot of people might have been tempted to try and recover something, but that that was never there in the first place to recover. Is that fair to say? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's keep us moving on. We've just got a couple more because we wanted to just mention this, Charlie, because I believe this may be one of the locations, which is pretty amazing. It's rather Martian looking. Yes, it is. I, I just dropped it in for fun because when I first went, I thought, gosh, what's that going to be like? I'm staying there, you know, will it, you know, will there be a loo and, you know, what would the food be like? The natural things that uh, we, we would be concerned about. Oh, my word, there certainly is. Um, beautifully done. There are quite a few camps of this nature and they're very, very sensitively placed in really, really good positions. And, um, and they, the important thing is that we're, we are near our photography in the mornings and, of course, in the evenings. And then, um, and we eat there too, which is works really well. Well, um, there he is. Yes, a special one. We wanted to just put a little someone in to finish, didn't we? Yes, T. E. Lawrence. And I was saying to Sam earlier how suitable it was that um, the great Peter O'Toole um, was um, asked to play Lawrence in his film Lawrence of Arabia, um, which is still as good now as it was then, especially when they attacked the train. It was extraordinary. Um, born in 1888, I think. He was an archaeologist and an army officer. 
And uh, do look, I won't go into it now, and I'd, anyway, I need to refresh my memory, but his role in the Arab uprising um, was, I think, really, really important. Um, and uh, well worth studying him, and well worth having a look at Lawrence of Arabia once again. Uh, and, and Dr. Shivago, if only to see Lean's great work. Fantastic. Good. Well, Charlie, a huge thank you. Amazingly, I've got this bang on time again. This is a miracle. Um, I would just like to say thank you very much for joining me and, and everybody out there for joining us all around the world. We've had South Africa and all sorts going on in terms of location. So thank you so much, Charlie. Welcome. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Hope you didn't mind some of my forthright statements, but we all feel strongly about things, don't we? Long live, long live photography. Absolutely. And just a little one for everyone who's still with us next week. Uh, we're carrying on this series. Um, lockdown, no lockdown. Uh, we are Tuesday, 8 p.m. every week here on Facebook. Um, uh, we're going to be talking to some of the different leaders about different areas that they go to. And we've got Margaret Soraya coming up next week, with some of the locks of Scotland. And I'm really looking forward to getting hmm. to that one. Uh, but Charlie, I know it's December, isn't it? The tour where you go to Jordan. Yeah. Yes. So all the details of that, if anyone's intrigued by it, are on the Light and Land website. And we hope that you've enjoyed visiting uh, this this area, this part of the world. And I personally, I find it very interesting when we get to look into the background about the place, because that background can inform, hopefully, our photography and um, really, like Charlie's mentioned, help us to connect to the place and have really memorable experiences there as well. Any final thoughts, Charlie, before I close us down? Um, yes, I do, actually. Um, and I, and I, think, I think all of our photographer friends, and you and I have, um, have, have a good number who we respect and are very fond of, um, I think I can hear them echoing these words, which is, do try and photograph more. Wherever you are, just try and photograph more. More, more practice, see more, observe more, get that camera out. Um, even if you come back empty-handed, you've had a go. I'll just leave it at that. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to be bringing this to a close, but do join us next week, 8 p.m. with Margaret Soraya. And uh, keep your eye on the Light and Land Facebook page and the newsletter. It's worth signing up to the newsletter because we share all the links and we share what's up next and, and replays and all the rest of it. But for now, from Charlie and I, good night. We shall speak to you again very soon.